like me, when you think of high watt amps, you pretty much just think of one person and it's David Gilmour, right? The high watt sound, at least in my mind for a long time was just you know, the, the shine on you crazy diamond sound or anything off of the wall or animals. But after I've gotten to play a few of these amps over the years and experienced them firsthand, I learned that there's a lot more going on with these amp circuits than originally met my eye. And I think that's true for a lot of other players out there. High watts are way more than just big, clean amps that'll peel the paint off of any room that you happen to turn one up in. They're capable of way more than that. So in today's video, we're gonna take a deep dive into the high watt sound. Talk about the amp's history, where the circuits came from, what made them so popular in the late 60s through the early to mid 70s, and really try to answer the question, what is the high watt sound? It's not what you think. The story of High Watt starts with a man named Dave Reeves. In the late 1950s and early 1960s in England, Dave was working as an electronics repairman and engineer, uh, and also worked for companies like Millard in the electronics field. Now, where Dave lived, there was a small music room, a small venue, if you will. And it's said that he got the idea to start High Watt, to start building his own amps when a local band called The Highlights came through and played his room. And the story goes that that night, one of their amps blew up and Dave looked at it and said, well, hell, I could probably build a better amp than that. He Probably actually didn't sound like he was from North Georgia. He probably had a nice posh uh, English accent. Uh, I'm not going to offend my English viewers by trying to attempt a, uh, an English accent. Now, Dave's early amps were somewhat interesting. They used a script logo and they had sort of a Vox vibe, which makes sense because at the time in the early to mid 1960s in England, uh, you really had Vox and Marshall. Those were kind of the only two guitar amp companies out there to speak of. Orange hadn't really started catching on quite yet. Around 1966, Reeves took his first order of guitar amps from Ivor Arbiter, who owned a guitar store, a music store called Sound City. And these are the first Sound City amps. They were original high watts. They were Dave Reeves' designs, his own amps that were just rebranded, rebadged with the Sound City name. Now, Reeves took about 800 pounds for that first order of amps from Arbiter for the Sound City run, uh, which was a lot of money in 66. But rather than continue to work to build amps under the Sound City logo, he decided to continue on building High Watt. He wanted to build his own brand. And in an interesting turn of events, not long after that, Arbiter took Reeves to court claiming that they actually owned the circuit design, that he was actually just cloning Sound City circuits under the High Watt name. Now, during the court proceedings, Dave actually asked the Sound City engineers, who at the time were just reproducing his design, uh, what a few blank holes in the chassis were for. And the Sound City engineers in court evidently couldn't answer that. They didn't know. And so as such, they couldn't prove that it was their own design, and Reeves won the case. They proved in court that it really was his own amp design. I think that's actually a pretty interesting part of the story. Now, in the early days of High Watt, they were what we would now call a boutique company. Very, very small operation, building a handful of amps at a time, and they were actually selling direct to players. Uh, they didn't want to have to develop a dealer network and, and deal with all that stuff, and they figured out that they could make more money just by selling direct to the guitar players themselves. And it was this model, uh, the sales model, that actually started helping them catch on around England in the mid to late 60s. Now, this all came to a head around 1970, 
when a guitar player by the name of Pete Townsend of The Who decided to start playing high watt amps. If you've ever seen the Live at Leeds concert footage, you've seen a literal wall of high watt amps. Uh, I can't imagine what that must have sounded like in person. It was probably uh, an assault on the senses in the best way possible, of course. And it was this Pete Townsend connection that really helped put High Watt on the map. Honestly, if Pete had decided to play a different amp, I'm not sure that this amp would be sitting next to me on my desk. like Pete Townsend and Dave Gilmore loved these amps, but what was it about the tone and the feel of these things that made them so unique? What's different from a high watt to something like a Marshall or an Orange or Vox or Fender equivalent of the time? Well, the first thing to know is the two different high watt heads that are essentially the high watt sound. The most famous of them all is the 100 watt, the DR-103. That's what Gilmore played. That's what The Who is playing live at Leeds, and it is a monster. That amp with the matching 412 cab is 100% on my bucket list of amps to own one day. Then there's this one. This is the DR504. This is a 50 watt head. Between the DR103 and the 504, you essentially have the high watt sound. Now, if you've been around my channel for a while, you might recognize this amp. This is my custom 20. And this is an amazing little amp, but this isn't really the high watt sound. This does something a little bit different. And as such, we're gonna save this for a different video. Now, Dave Reeves' circuit design is surprisingly simple, and the layout on the front panel is surprisingly simple. You have a four input, two channel amp, you have a normal and a bright channel with a three band EQ and a master volume. It's got EL34s in the power section, 12 AX7s in the preamp, and if you know anything about British amps of the time, you might think, well, that sounds like a Marshall, but this doesn't sound like a Marshall. So right now I'm going into the normal input, the normal channel. I've got my strap plugged in, and this is right now a really nice, lush, clean sound. Now that's nice, nothing really to write home about, but this amp takes effects really well. If I kick on my Univibe, you get... So now you start to understand why guys like Gilmore like these amps. They were nice sort of canvases to use, to paint on, to use different effects and, and to try out new things. And you could get a clean sound like that at a really, really loud volume. You can't tell on YouTube, but if you were in the same room with this amp on its cab at this setting, it would be, uh, it'd be punishing. Now, I always thought that's where the high watt sound sort of ended. They were just big, beefy, clean amps. But if I push this normal volume up, you get... That doesn't sound like a Marshall. That doesn't sound like a Vox or an Orange. It really is its own thing. Now, like other great four input amps, one of the best things you can do with a design like this is jump the two channels together. And when you do that, you essentially cascade both channels into one another. You can use the volume controls to dial in a sound that is not possible when you're just using the channels by themselves. Case in point, if I add a little bit of the normal volume and a little bit of the bright volume, now we're in a new territory. <laughs> Now I start to understand why guys like Pete Townsend went for this thing, because it really does its own unique style of breakup. It doesn't have the same mid-range kick and, and bitey top end that a Marshall has, but it doesn't have the tweed thing either. It's It sounds like a high watt. And if I hit it with a boost pedal in front... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Now there's another factor that plays into the sound of the high watt amp aside from the circuit design and that's actually how these things are built. Now I need to shout out a resource here. This is a website that I found when I was researching for this video called highwatt.org and this is amazing. This is exactly the type of stuff that I love coming across uh, when making these videos. If you are a nerd for this kind of stuff at all, you have to check this website out. It's linked in the description box down below. It has every detail you could ever want to know when it comes to high watt amps and Dave Reeves and the, the different eras and classifications. And it gives you these gut shots. And this is what I'm talking about. The way that Dave Reeves was building these amps back in the 60s was, I mean, just beautiful. Dave was known for using this trademark right angles and neat bundles approach to wiring the amp. And if you know anything about amp circuit design, especially hand wired uh, turret board and point to point amps like this, you know that the wiring affects the sound, how much wire is in the chassis, how the wire is run, what wires are crossing, where it does affect the tonality and the response of the amplifier. Now the plight of the small boutique guitar gear builder is a tale as old as time right starts off as one guy or girl building a cool thing in their garage and then someone picks it up it gets really popular they can't keep up with orders and they have to hire help or risk going under and this is what happened to dave reeves in the mid to late 60s but he couldn't just hire any electronics expert or any wire to put these amps together because he wanted someone that would match or exceed his standard for wiring with that super neat and tidy approach and that's when he found harry joyce in 1971 when Reeves approached Harry Joyce to start wiring these amps, Joyce was skeptical at first. He and his team were actually busy building uh, electronics for the British Navy at the time. It truly was military spec. But eventually Joyce agreed to start building the high watt amps for Dave Reeves under one condition. Joyce's shop would not produce more than 40 amps per month. If you think about that, that's crazy. I mean, seriously, if you're interested in this stuff at all, go look at these pictures of how these amps are wired. It's in, it's just beautiful. It's like the best cable management stuff on the internet. It's, it's honestly like a work of art. If this were my amp, I would actually crack it open and, and show it on camera, but I'm borrowing it, so... I'm not going to do that. You'll have to look at the pictures instead. Now, it's not just the circuitry and the quality of the wiring on the inside that matters too. There's also a huge, huge factor that cannot be ignored when you're talking about high watt amps, and that is the cabinet the high watt cabinet and specifically the Fane speakers. Now when high watt and Dave Reeves were building these cabs in the mid to late sixties, they were going for robustness. They were trying to make these cabinets super roadworthy. Uh, touring bands at the time were dragging these amps and cabs all over Europe and North America, and they wanted to build something that would stand up. And in so doing, they made the cabinet incredibly beefy. I mean, even in these modern reissues, you can tell there's so much more just material material here. They were also bracing the inside of these cabs in nine different places just to make them way stronger, and they did. But it also had the effect of changing the response of the cabinet. But a huge role in the high watt sound is not just the cab's construction, but what's in the cabinet, which are Fane speakers. I think if you really want to get the true high watt sound, you have to be playing Fane speakers. So to demonstrate, I'm actually gonna play this cab mic'd up with a 121 and an Encore 100i, and then I'm gonna patch in my divided by 13 cabinet here, play the exact same part. I have a loop saved on my pedal board. Uh, the amp settings are not changing. So you're gonna hear the exact same guitar part, same amp settings through these two different cabs. This high watt 212 loaded with fanes and my divided by 13 212, which is loaded with Celestian Greenback 25s. Another incredibly popular guitar speaker that people like Marshall would have been using at the time. And if you listen, you should be able to hear the differences between the two cabinets. Uh, this one really does the high watt sound. <laughs> So that is the high watt sound. I really love these amps. Uh, they kind of hold a special place in my heart. You know, when I first started getting into guitar as 13, 14 years old, uh, 
Pink Floyd was the first real band that I remember diving headfirst into. And so that DR-103 and, and the 504 here, they kind of helped shape my understanding and love of guitar and music. And uh, I think that's a really great legacy that Dave Reeves has left behind. Not just inspiring me, but inspiring countless other musicians and guitar players by the artists who used these amps to make some incredible music over the years. If you like this video, I have a whole series of these what is the sound stories. You can check that out here or in the description box down below. And if you're new here, welcome. Please subscribe. I make new guitar videos every single week. So click the subscribe button and the bell icon to be notified whenever I'm putting up new content. As always, if you want to support the channel, check out the links down below in the description. I have my tone course and my Nashville number system video courses down there available on a brand new teaching platform we just switched over to retshulguitarcourses.com we've been working really hard on this behind the scenes and i'm really proud of how it came out so uh, if you're interested in learning about the ins and outs of great guitar tone or uh, how to really understand and use the nashville number system i have two video courses available down below uh, that you can check out thanks again for watching my name is Rhett shull and remember there is no plan b